Okay, I'm, I'm going to read the passage, and then we'll dive in. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Uh, that's as far as we're going to read. Uh, let me, first of all, bring up the topic for today that this scripture passage uh, calls to our mind, and the topic is this, Christian joy and peace. And what the Apostle Paul here is saying is that there's a, a kind of joy and peace that uh, is really, it's life-altering, it's earth-shattering, it's uh, mind-changing. There's a kind of joy and peace that can go up beyond and supersede and transcend all your situations, all your circumstances, uh, something that gives you great poise in the midst of whatever it is life might throw at you. Uh, let me say just a little bit about the book of Philippians. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote 13 letters that are in our New Testament. So uh, of the 27 books in the New Testament, 13 of them were written by the Apostle Paul. Four of those 13 are called prison letters. Uh, the reason they're called prison letters is that Paul actually wrote them when he was sitting in prison. This is one of those letters. And, um, you know, when we talk about joy and peace, I think it's very important as, you know, it's the theme of this entire letter, this kind of joy that, that Christians can have, this kind of peace that supersedes all of our, our circumstances that, that can be ours. It's really the theme of this letter. It's important for me to say that as the Apostle Paul was, was saying, rejoice. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. He was sitting in a jail cell. I, I think it's important to just take note of that and, and then to just add to it, I'll, I'll say this, that if you begin to learn about the Apostle Paul's life, if you begin to, to read about the things he went through, you will see that, um, you know, he really, you can't say to yourself, well, of course he had a peaceful life. His life was awesome and my life, no, his life was very difficult. In fact, um, in the book of Acts, when the Apostle Paul is, is being called by God, God actually says uh, about him in, in Acts chapter 9, verse 16, I will show him, Paul, how much he must suffer for my name. And uh, Paul really went through tremendous, if you read about his life, physical, emotional, spiritual suffering. He, he knew hunger and imprisonment. Uh, he, he was in prison many, many times. He, he was betrayed by people. He faced uh, illness and sickness. Uh, the beatings that he took. Uh, he, he was beat many times. He, he was stoned to the point of death. He was flogged five different times that we know about as we read through the Bible. This is a man who, who went through tremendous suffering. He was shipwrecked at one point and spent the night on open sea. He had just tremendous difficulties in suffering, and yet he's got this peace and this joy that he has found, that he has learned about, that has helped him transcend whatever circumstances. And, and as he's sitting in a jail cell, um, he's just full of joy and, and full of peace. Probably the opposite of this joy and peace is anxiety. So um, I'm sure as I talk about anxiety and stress, there's people here who can relate, whether it's uh, work, uh, the boss, whether it's the dates you're going on or the lack of dates you're going on, whether it's broken relationships, whether it's the news or politics or family circumstances or bills. I mean, we're, all of us, uh, there are these things that life just throws at us that can be incredibly anxiety producing, that can be incredibly stress producing. And Paul says that, that he has found and has come to know a peace 
that if you look at verse 7, it says, transcends all understanding and guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Probably the opposite of anxiety is poise. Um, there's a poise. There's a peace. There's a joy that the Apostle Paul, he has it. He says it's available to those who are in Christ that um, he has found. Uh, that's the topic. Let me make a couple of observations uh, about this peace and joy, which the Apostle Paul holds out to Christians. And just, I think it's important to make these observations. First of all, I just want to put on the screen here verses 12 and 13 of Philippians chapter 4. I want you to see what the Apostle Paul, he, he says, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And you can see I, I bold in and italicize the word learned. Paul says, I have learned, which means that it, it's been a process. It also means that he didn't start out knowing, right? If you've learned something, it's not something that you innately have. It's something that, you, you know, I mean, it's not something you start out knowing. It's something that you gain little by little as you go along. And I think that's important. Paul is not saying here, I've been able to, to go through all these things because, you know, I'm such an awesome guy and I'm so super strong. I mean, no, he's not saying that at all. In fact, he at one point talks about how, you know, it's in the midst of his weaknesses, that he really finds Christ's strength. Um, this is something that, that he learned, and um, I think that might be helpful to those of us who if we say to ourselves, well, I, man, you know, throw me in prison, flog me five times, shipwreck me, you know, I just can't, I'm, I'm having a tough time with my bills and, you know, my work. Um, this, if you don't have it, you're in the same camp as the Apostle Paul when he started out. It's not something he started with, it's something that as he walked his Christian life, he learned. And so, um, you know, the good news of the gospel is that we're, we're saved. We're, we're set free. We're given this freedom. Our sins are forgiven. But it's better than that because, you know, once we have that starting point, there, there's this way in which we can grow in our Christian walk. And the Apostle Paul ha has grown. He's learned. He, he's expanded. He's found more peace. He's found more comfort. He's found more joy as he's gone along. So that's the first observation. If you're hearing about this peace and joy, you're a Christian, and you're saying, man, I don't think I have that yet. Uh, it's okay. It's not something you're supposed to have automatically. It's something you, you learn as you go. Uh, second observation that I'd like to make, and this observation is actually, it's about this passage, but I'd like to just make an observation about all of Paul's letters. They follow the same pattern. So whether you're reading the book of Romans or the book of Ephesians or the book of Colossians, all of Paul's letters, they follow a very, a very kind of similar pattern. And um, this is how I'll describe it, and, and then I'll explain what I mean. The imperative flows out of the indicative. Now, I see the looks you're giving me like, oh, no. the imperative flows out of the indicative. The imperative is, here's what we ought to do. So Paul says, you ought to do this. In, in this particular passage, it says, rejoice. You should rejoice. I'll say it again. You should rejoice. That's what you ought to do. It flows out of the indicative, what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Um, really important point. So if you're reading the book of Romans, or the book of Ephesians. The first 11 chapters of the book of Romans talk about what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Beginning in chapter 12 then, he says, okay, in light of that, here's how you ought to live. Or if you're reading the book of Ephesians, the first four chapters talk about what God has done in Jesus Christ. And then he begins as, he continues the book to say, okay, now in light of that, here's how you ought to live. Um, it's a very predictable pattern, I think it's so important it's not that the imperative comes before the indicative. In other words, you should do that so that God will do this. Instead, it's here's what God has done. Now that you've got that, all right, here's how to live. If you come to sunlight for very long, um, we summarize the entire message of the Bible, the good news of the Bible, with three words. Sin, salvation, and service. And um, just to kind of quickly summarize those Three words, sin. The Bible makes it very clear that every single one of us are our sinners. We, we all fail to live up to God's perfect standard for us. 
Uh, we don't live up to our own standard, much less the standard that God has for us. We're, we're all lawbreakers. We commit crimes against God in our thoughts, words, and deeds. And um, here's the thing. God is righteous and just, which means that he, he'll punish sin. And the Bible makes it very clear that the punishment for sin is death. In fact, the book of Romans says the wages of sin is death. What you deserve, what you earn, if you're a sinner, is death. And um, there's nothing you can do to, to now make yourself fundamentally pleasing to God. It doesn't matter how religious you become or how hard you try. Uh, the fact of the matter is we're increasing our guilt every single day. We're all sinners. We're all lost. That's sin. Salvation. What we couldn't do, God did for us. In his love and his mercy... God sent someone to be a substitute to take our place. God the Father sent God the Son to be the perfect substitute. The perfect substitute because he was both fully human. Human beings are the ones who have sinned. We have to pay for our own sin. And fully God. You know, no mere human being could bear the weight of all sin. And so, you know, this substitute had to be both fully human and fully God. And what happened is this. On the cross, God took all our sin. He took all our guilt. He took all our shame, and, and he put it on Jesus and punished Jesus in our place. We said the wages of sin is death. If you read about Jesus' life, he never sinned even one time. Why did he have to die? Because he was taking our punishment. Three days later after he dies, he rose again from the grave, and that proves that our two enemies, sin and death, are completely defeated and overcome. That's what Jesus has done. I have just explained to you the indicative what God has done for us in Jesus. The third S, sin, salvation, service, is now the Christian life. If, first of all, you turn from your sin and its consequences to a new life lived with and for Jesus, if you put your faith in Jesus, God will give you a brand new life. And if you do that, then you'll be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, and you'll begin to live a new life, a life that's characterized by good works. And uh, there's a whole pattern for what that Christian looks like. Life looks like, uh, in light of what God has done, here's what we now as Christians ought to do. That's the imperative, sin, salvation, service. Maybe if S's don't appeal to you, how about three G's? Guilt, grace, gratitude, right? And, and, and I want to just point out, it's that, that third section. It's out of thanksgiving or gratitude that we now live our lives. In fact, the Apostle Paul, he, he says that here. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So out of a sense of gratitude, now you have a relationship with God. Here's how you ought to live. Okay, so, um, you know, the topic is joy, peace. It's offered to Christians. It's not something that we have automatically. It's something that you learned, and uh, it flows out of what God has done for us. So when Paul says rejoice, I'll say it again, rejoice, it's not a command, here's how you get yourself close to God. Out of the overflow of what God has done for us, here's how we ought now to live. And um, now that I've said all of that, uh, I'd like to talk about the main principle. You say to yourself, well, I'd love to have some of that peace. I'd love to learn to get that kind of joy. I'd love it when I face my bills or my relationships or my work. Instead of feeling anxiety and stress, and worry and concern. I'd love to have the kind of peace and poise that the Apostle Paul talks about here and is offered by the Christian faith. How do I get that? And um, there's just one big idea that I want to tell you about today. And the one big idea is this. And, and by the way, if you were to walk into um, a bookstore and you were to pick out any book on the shelf about how to deal with stress, about how to deal with anxiety. I am about to say the Bible gives pretty much the opposite advice as all those books. Are you ready for it? Here it is, the one big idea. You, as a Christian, have got to think. You've got to think. So look at verse 8 again. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever's noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, look what Paul says. Think about such things. Okay, you've become a Christian now. Uh, now is not the time to turn off your brain. Now is the time to do something very important. You must begin to think. Uh, think. 
why this is so opposite. Uh, so you go pick out any book uh, on the shelf about worry, anxiety, stress. Uh, here's what those books are generally going to tell you. Um, you've got to stop thinking. Um, so you're worried about bills. You're worried about your boss. You're, you've got to find some mental strategy to bracket those things out. Um, that's sort of the strategy. of the, You've got to bracket those things out. You've got to turn your mind off. Like your mind's thinking about all these things. Stop. You've got to flip the switch or turn it off. This is what books will say. In fact, um, our culture's main way of dealing with stress today is amusement. Uh, so, man, you know, it's been a tough day. It's been hard. I'm going through some things. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm going to tune out. Right? And so we, we turn on the TV and we just, I'm going to be amused. Uh, okay, musing is thinking. If you amuse yourself, what do you do? You stop thinking. Our culture, I mean, listen, if you're having stress, what you've got to do is you've got to get away from your office, you've got to get on a sandy beach, you've got to turn your mind off, you've got to be amused, stop thinking. And the Apostle Paul, he has exactly the opposite advice. If you become a Christian, here's what you need to do. You need to start thinking. Whatever's true or noble or right or pure or lovely or admirable, if anything's excellent or praiseworthy, start thinking. Think about these things. You got to think about these things. Now, when the Apostle Paul says that you must think about these things, and he, he talks about what's true or noble or right or lovely or admirable, um, it might seem that that's really ethereal. It, it's not. You know, when the Apostle Paul mentions these things, he's not ta just talking in sort of general ethereal terms about whatever's true or right or good out, you know, let's just find our happy place. He's not talking about that. He's actually saying you need to think about Christian teaching, Christian doctrine, what's true. So here's the first thing you need to do. You need to start asking yourself the question, you know, who am I? Where did I come from? Who is God? How does my salvation work? Um, that he's talking about those things are, are so clear by verse 9. He says this, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me. Whatever you've seen in me, the Apostle Paul says, you've got to put that into practice. What is it that the Apostle Paul taught? What is it that he, he hoped people would receive? It's the good news of the gospel, that we're sinners who are saved by grace. And so when he's saying you've got to think about what's true and right and noble and lovely and admirable. He's not just talking about ethereal things. He, he's saying you've got to think about Christian truth. You've got to think about Christian doctrine. You've got to, once, once you start asking those questions, who is God? Who is Jesus? Who am I? What does it mean that I'm a sinner who's saved? You've got to start churning those thoughts through your mind and, and working them out, the implications of them. Maybe I'll work this the other way. So let's come at it from another direction. I'm going to put four quotes here on the screen. These uh, four quotes are all from people who are, uh, are basically atheists or come from an atheistic perspective. People who don't believe in God, don't believe there's a meaning to life. The first two are scientists. The last two are uh, writers. So uh, first, Charles Darwin. So he says this, a person who has no assured or ever-present belief in the existence of a personal God or a future existence with retribution and reward can have for his rule of life, as far as I can see, only to follow those impulses and instincts which are the strongest or which seem to him the best ones. So let me translate. Here's what he's saying. Since he's come to understand that there really is no God, you really can't have a principle or rule for life other than this, do whatever you think is best. He's saying there's no such thing as right or wrong. You may think or feel that there's a right or wrong. You may, that might occur to you. You might have that feeling, but there's no reality behind it. There's no God, which means there is no right or wrong. Just do whatever you think is best. Someone may say to you, you can't do that. Who are they to say you can't do that? If there's no God, there's no judge, there's, there's no standard, what he's saying is just... Follow whatever it is you think is finally best. Uh, that's what Charles Darwin, he, he's sort of thinking about the fact, okay, I've 
I've worked this out. We got here randomly by chance. There's been this long process of evolution. Uh, therefore, there is no God. And so when it comes to having a rule for life or meaning or purpose, um, you know, even if you feel there is one, there's not. There's no right and wrong. Just do whatever you think your impulses lead you to do. Uh, the next quote comes from Richard Dawkins. This is what he says. He says, we are machines built by DNA whose purpose is to make more copies of the same DNA. Flowers are for the same thing as everything else in the living kingdoms, for spreading copy me programs about written in DNA language. That is exactly what we are for. We are machines for propagating DNA and the propagation of DNA is a self-sustaining process. It's every living object's sole reason for living. DNA neither cares nor knows. DNA just is, and we dance to his music. Let me translate. So some of you have this feeling that you're special. You're not. Uh, you're just the same as a flower. You know, uh, your feelings of being special are just DNA's way of making sure you survive. And um, your survival is important because you need to, to propagate, you know, and pass that DNA on to, you know, the next human being. And um, don't think to yourself you're special or that there's any more meaning or purpose to life than that. You're just a machine that's been built up to, to propagate DNA. That's all you are. You're no different than a flower or an amoeba or a dog or a monkey. You're just, that's, that's life. I mean, there's purpose in life. You're special. Come on. Get real, your DNA machines. That's what he's saying. Okay, those are the two scientists, now two writers. First, Mark Twain. So uh, this is his description of life. A myriad of men are born. They labor and sweat and struggle. They squabble and scold and fight. They scramble for little mean advantages over each other. Age creeps upon them, infirmities follow. Those they love are taken from them, and the joy of life is turned aching grief. It, says the release, comes at last, the only unpoisoned gift Earth ever had for them, and they vanish from a world where they were of no consequence, a world which will lament them a day and forget them forever. Here's what he's saying. There's really no meaning or purpose to life. I mean, you just show up, you Spend your energy on whatever you spend your energy on, you die. People are going to remember you for like a day, but then the universe goes on. There was no purpose or meaning to your life whatsoever. Okay? Finally, uh, this comes from Shakespeare. It's a famous line from the play Macbeth. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day. To the last syllable of recorded time, and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out! Out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Here's what he's saying, uh, okay. You know what your life is? You're like somebody who I cast for one of my plays, he says, that has some two-bit part, and uh, he's not really a good actor, and so he's just a backup role, and... He gets himself all worked up about making sure he gets his lines, and he really thinks, man, if I do well, maybe it'll come to something, but it won't. It's a stupid play. It was written by an idiot. All the worrying you did, all the ways you worked yourself up, it signifies nothing. Um, all four of these quotes, they, they speak to what life would be like if there is no God. I mean, if you believe there is no God, this is sort of the, the working out of, of what finally life is. I mean, it has no purpose, it's no meaning, you're just DNA propagators, you're just, you know, you're just an idiot playing a stupid part on a stage that will come to nothing. And um, probably in this room there are people who, um, I mean, maybe you'd never say these things out loud, but you share the same beliefs as Richard Dawkins and Charles Darwin and Mark Twain. I mean, this whole God thing to you, I mean, it's just for the weak and weak-minded. Uh, you, you're sort of considering it, but at the end of the day, I mean, it's really not for you. Here's, here's the thing. Maybe, maybe for you, you'd say to yourself, I, I mean, okay, I get that those are the implications, but it's better for me not to, to think out those things. I'm just going to live my life. And uh, if that's you, then I just want to, 
to point out what you're doing. You find peace by not thinking. I mean, if that's you and you just say, okay, uh, yeah, I don't think there's a God, but I'm not going to think about all this dark, dour stuff. I mean, come on, fine. But then just so it's plain, you find peace by not thinking about reality. Here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says there is a God. This God created us all. We are sinners who, who strayed from him. God does love us. He came and rescued us at the cost of his one and only son. And uh, he, he sent a spirit to, to change and transform us. And, and if you're a Christian and you want to find peace, then you need to think about it. You need to wrestle it. And it's not just think about it every once in a while. You've got to think out all the implications. You've got to think your way through. Okay, uh, I'm going through this sickness right now, but, but okay, wait. This life is very brief, and there's an eternal home, and I'm going to have a renewed body. And these light and momentary afflictions that I'm going through right now are returning for me a weight of eternal glory. You've got to think your way. Whatever you're going through, okay, I'm struggling with this boss at my work, and he's a jerk, and yeah, but okay, maybe God's put you in his providential hand. He's put you in that place for a reason, for a purpose, to shine a light, and maybe it's going to be that you have the opportunity, and even through your struggles and suffering, people are going to see the way you act. They're going to see something in you that's different. And it's going to, God knows what he's doing. You've got to think your way through everything that you're facing. And once you do, and you realize God's in charge. Whatever struggles I have right now are light and momentary. As you think your way through those things, you will finally begin to have what the Apostle Paul describes here, a peace that passes or transcends our circumstances, a joy that's so deep-seated that life circumstances can't get at them. Here's how I'd like to conclude. I came across this, uh, I think it's, it's fascinating. Uh, a lot of us will know very well Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He this, this is uh, the anti-Psalm 23. What Psalm 23 would, would, would read if there was no God. And I'm just going to, I'm going to put it side by side here on the screen. Here it is. I am on my own. No one looks out for me or protects me. I experience a continual sense of need. Nothing is quite right. I'm always restless, easily frustrated, and often disappointed. My soul feels broken, twisted, and stuck. I can't fix myself. I'll place next to it Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Hopefully already you're getting a sense. If I understand and believe that there's a God and I start to think about what that means for life, I mean, do you see the drastic difference it'll have as you face life's woes? Uh, Psalm 23 continued. I stumble down some dark paths. Still I insist I want to do what I want, when I want, how I want. I'm haunted by emptiness and futility, the shadows of death. Death is waiting for me at the end of every road, but I'd rather not think about that. I spend my life protecting myself. Bad things can happen. I have no comfort. Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Do you sense the difference that faith can make? Do you understand the kind of peace and joy that if you finally believe that there's a God who's your shepherd, that he's in charge, you see what a difference it'll finally make. You've got to think about these things. The final lines, I'm alone, facing all that could hurt me. Are my friends really friends? Other people use me for their own needs. No one is really for me except me. And I'm so much all about me, sometimes it's sickening. I'm finally haunted by this question, will I just be obliterated into nothingness? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
I don't know about you, but I'll be the first to admit that as I read the lines of the anti-Psalm 23, way too often those thoughts are what's in here. The Apostle Paul says, okay, and again, I want to stress, this flows out of our salvation. The imperative follows the indicative. If you're a person who has come to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have now begun a journey where you've got to start to make your way through. You've got to think about what it means that God's your shepherd, that he's the waiter at your table, that he loves you, that he cares for you, that he died for you. Whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Paul says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, now here's what you've got to do. Start putting it into practice and the God of peace will be with you.